it's Sunday afternoon, time for the Money Show. Here we are on Sunday, February 20th, 2005, and this is yours truly. Oh, yours truly, Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad to be back with you for this hour when we talk about money, the economy, your investments, finances in general, uh, how much change I have in my pocket, just anything having to do with money. And this is brought to you in part by the folks at the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, a way of seeking safety and stability in an uncertain world. And you can get more information about those funds, especially the Permanent Portfolio Fund, by calling 1-800-531-5142 or going to permanentportfolio.com. Uh, pardon me, permanentportfoliofund.com on the Internet. Well, you know, I hear so often about science. Uh, some investment system has been tested scientifically, or there are scientific reasons that something has to happen. And, of course, a great deal of that science is really economics at work or supposedly at work that there are economic principles that tell us that inflation has to come back this year or that gold has to go up or that the stock market is due for a fall or for a rise or whatever it is and uh, this is based supposedly on the irrefutable principles of economics and yet somehow we find that great secret in the investment world that nothing ever works out the way it's supposed to, including all those scientifically tested programs, including all those economically based predictions of the future and so on. And so I thought it might be good to take a look at this. Why is it that science and economics aren't able to tell us exactly what's going to happen in the investment markets? After all, uh, Science predicts the flow of uh, tomorrow's tides. And, in fact, science predicts the very day that Halley's Comet is going to arrive again in this century. It just seems as though with the right economic theories, uh, sufficient data, and maybe a large enough computer, and, of course, a scientific attitude, we should be able to predict next year's inflation rate. And yet we can't. So what's wrong? Well, part of it is applying science to investing really isn't quite so simple. And so I think it's vital to understand what economics is and how it can help you, but it's even more important, I think, to appreciate the limitations of economics. A proper understanding of the scope and reach of economics can explain, I think, why so many of the best laid investment plans go awry. But let's start by looking at what economics is, because people talk about it and don't understand the basis of economics itself. There are two basic elements studied by economics, and these elements are resources and desires. Just plain old everyday desires form a basic part of economics. But let's start with the resources. Uh, you, as an individual, have certain resources just by being human. Uh, those resources include personal energy, intelligence, knowledge that you've acquired, the time that's available to you. However, every one of these resources is limited. You have only so much energy, so much intelligence, and so much knowledge. And since you aren't going to live forever... You have only so much time in which to use those resources. Now, in pursuit of your goals, the things that you want in life, you apply your human resources to the world around you. Uh, but the availability of human resources, uh, pardon me, the availability of natural resources, such as land, water, air, minerals, vegetation, and all of that, the availability of those resources is also limited because of the limits of nature and because the human resources that people need for the discovery and exploitation of natural resources are limited. 
Because we're limited as human beings, we can only exploit so much of nature's bounty. So, the application of human resources to natural resources produces the products and services that you and other people want. Uh, you get them either for immediate consumption or to use in producing other products or services, eventually for consumption. But then, the, because of the limitation of human and natural resources, the quantity of products and services that are produced also is necessarily limited. Limited to what human resources can extract from the available natural resources. For example, there may be enough timber growing in the world to supply every human being on this earth with a house. But there might not be enough manpower to harvest the timber, uh, to mill the lumber, to manufacture the tools and construct the houses, let alone cook lunch for everyone until the work is completed. So it can seem that some people possess unlimited resources. But in fact, not even the richest man in the world can spend his money with abandon, and the most oppressive government quickly finds that there is a limit to the resources it can extract from its citizens. All right, so that's number one of the two elements, resources. The second element of economics is human desire. Every individual, including you and including me, has wants. Your wants may include short-term goals, such as what you're going to do in the next few minutes, whether you're going to take the time listening to this show or go out and mow the lawn or walk around in the rain. Um, you also have long-term goals, such as what you want to do 20 years from now, how much you want to have in your retirement fund, and, of course, a whole lot of goals in between just today and 20 years from now. Different things that you have in mind, different plans, different goals. Now, your desires might be what we think of as being self-centered, such as wanting to acquire a large house and a fancy car. Or they might be what some people would call altruistic, such as uh, you might want to be a missionary and, or to feed the poor. Whatever your desires may be, they are your desires, and your efforts are aimed at satisfying those desires. Now, unlike resources, which are limited, desires are boundless. Your desires might seem modest, a small list of things that would make you content, but we usually only notice the desires that clamor the loudest or that can be satisfied the most easily. As soon as your desires are fulfilled, other wants become apparent, desires that were less urgent or were more difficult to satisfy or that arose from satisfying the first desires. Whatever, as soon as you satisfy anything, more desires become apparent and you realize at some point that your desires are endless, limitless that there is no end to the number of things that you might want to use if only or want to use do or whatever if you only had the resources well let's put these two elements resources and desires together to form the science of economics when we come back from this break and we are coming back and I'm going to check to make sure you're still here so don't go away this is Harry Brown We'll be back right after these announcements. This is Harry Brown. You've worked too hard for your savings to risk them on somebody's grand plan to double them. Wouldn't you rather have a safe, secure portfolio, one that grows steadily each year without the wide swings in the investment markets? For 25 years, I've shown people how to have such a portfolio, one that made money the past few years rather than losing heavily. Now you can get that same help from my book, Fail Safe Investing. You can have that secure, bulletproof portfolio. You can download Failsafe Investing at LibertyFree.com for only $9.75. 
Then read it on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. The book can give you the security you crave without becoming a speculator or a market whiz. Go to libertyfree.com to read a sample chapter and then start protecting your savings. Failsafe investing can be yours tonight at libertyfree.com. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and this is The Money Show. And we're talking about economics, and we'll wrap this up now by putting together the two elements that I've discussed, resources and desires. I said that resources are limited, and desires are not. Desires are unlimited. So only some of the desires can be satisfied, and, of course, satisfying those desires means neglecting other desires that you have. And always, gee, if I only had more time. Oh, gosh, if we only had a larger income. Oh, if I only had the knowledge to do this, whatever it may be. So an individual, you, me, anybody else, is forced to choose which desires you will try to satisfy, and you have to choose the means of satisfying them that will get the most from your limited resources. So, this is the concern of economics. This is why we have a science called economics. Economics is the study of the choices that people make, how they allocate limited resources to the satisfaction of unlimited desires. This applies on a personal level, as in the examples I've given you. It applies to a business that has only so much resources and is trying to do various things in order to maximize its profits. It applies to a nation so that when Congress is debating uh, what to do with the budget, they know there are limited resources, even though the government seems to have an unlimited power to tax, it doesn't. There are only so many resources available to it, so the nation collectively makes decisions about what to do with uh, certain resources. And, of course, I believe that those resources should be kept out of the hands of government and let individuals who own them do with them what they choose. But that's my personal opinion. Uh, but, again, economics is the sto study of the choices that people make how they allocate limited resources in order to satisfy as many of their unlimited desires as possible. Economics tries to identify the effects that flow from each choice, uh, particularly how each choice that you make affects your ability to satisfy other desires and what desires will have to be foregone as a result of it. And economics studies how the choices made by one person affect the opportunities available to other people. Ad economic issues can be as trivial as the question of whether to use your limited time to watch television or to clean the house instead. Or those decisions can be as far-reaching as trying to determine the cost to the nation of a national program of compulsory medical care. In short, economics tries to determine the consequences of decisions, including the wishes that would have to be abandoned or postponed in order to satisfy the desires that are being considered. And again, this is one of the problems with politicians, is they love to determine and focus on the benefits that will happen to people without in any uh, recognition whatsoever of the wishes that will have to be abandoned by the individuals paying for these programs. Economics studies how the choices people make today lead to the conditions of tomorrow. In this it is uh, similar to other branches of science that try to foresee tomorrow's effects from today's causes. But here's the rub. The physical sciences things like physics and chemistry, those physical sciences are quite different from the behavior, behavior the behavioral sciences. 
uh, which would include uh, economics, uh, psychology, sociology, and so forth. There's a vast difference between the physical sciences or the behavioral sciences. Uh, von Mises called the, the behavioral sciences the sciences of human action, and I prefer that because it's easier to pronounce. In fact, there's such a difference between the physical sciences and the study of human action that it may be confusing to even call economics a science. There are a number of reasons that economics doesn't live up to the hopes of people who want to use it scientifically, meaning in the manner of the physical sciences, uh, trying to predict the future or to construct reliable investment systems. And if we have more time later in this show, I'll start going into those reasons. And if we don't, then I'll go into them next week. But right now we have uh, someone on the phone, and it's James in Alaska. So let's uh, see what's on James' mind today. Hello, James. How are you doing, Harry? What's up? Oh, well, got to uh, looking at these uh, permanent portfolios. Uh, that you're talking about. I see there's four of them. Well, there are four funds in the permanent portfolio family of funds. The one that's the flagship of the organization is the permanent portfolio, and that's the fund that is constructed in the way that I have discussed on this show of having permanent, fixed, unchanging percentages allocated to each of several different investments in order to create a balanced and diversified portfolio. Go ahead. Which uh, which uh, symbol was that? PRPFX. And that's the only one that really uh, uh, that's really the the permanent portfolio style because, like I said, there's there's several others that are listed there. As yes, portfolios. The, the others are uh, one of them is a Treasury bill money market fund. It is one of only three uh, money market funds that I'm aware of that invest strictly only in treasury securities, not using even repurchase agreements or anything else. There are two others, and one is uh, from Neuberger and Berman, and the other one I think is from Dreyfus, and that's the absolute safest kind of money market funds you could have, no credit risk to, to think of at all. So it's and, a new return, though, right? Uh, right. It'll be slightly lower than the return on a money market fund that's investing in bank CDs and commercial paper and so on. Uh, then the other two are more speculative. One is an aggressive growth portfolio for people who want to speculate in stocks, and the variable bond portfolio is for people who want to speculate in bonds. It uh, buys high-grade uh, cor corporate bonds rather than government bonds and looks for ones that are safe uh, but also paying a, a, a higher rate of interest than treasury bonds would pay. Would and you recommend splitting up uh, an investment between those four? No. Uh, you need to, first of all, decide in your own mind which of your funds are going to be used for investment only and for the future and uh, are money that you cannot afford to lose. And then you also decide, do you want to speculate with some other funds? For the funds that you cannot afford to lose, the permanent portfolio fund or a permanent por portfolio you construct yourself, that should be that only. And then for money that you want to speculate with, you might want to try the aggressive growth portfolio or the variable bond fund or somebody else's mutual fund also. Uh, hang on, James. We'll be right back after these messages. This is Harry Brown. Don't go away, folks. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy-five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, 
Here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Failsafe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and the phone number is 1-800-259-9231, or you can email me, question at harrybrown.org. Phone number again, 1-800-259-9231, and that happy music that brought us back is meant to signify that life can be a joy, and you can make sure that your savings are safe, and that what you're putting away for the future will be there in the future and will grow and will not be hit by some wide swing in the stock market. So you can perhaps relax a little bit more and enjoy life. We're talking with James in Alaska, and before we went to the break, James, I said that the first decision you have to make is how much needs to be in a safe, portfolio with money that you cannot afford to lose and then do you want to and can you afford to have a little bit of money in what I call a variable portfolio one where you speculate and try to beat the market and once you've made that decision then you set up the safe portfolio in a way that you don't have to tinker with in the future and you don't have to keep making changes but with the a speculative portfolio, you can then decide, well, what might beat the market? Where, where am I getting some hot tip that I think uh, I ought to bet a little bit of money on? And you do that with the speculative portfolio. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I also noticed that it was about a probably a $25 fee for transaction fee up front. Uh, um, yes, it's just uh, uh, with the fund. It's, it, it's just to join the fund. It's a one-time fee. And right, but you don't have to pay anything to get the, to transfer out of it, right? Correct. There are absolutely no sales expenses at all. Uh, just when you uh, start, you pay that fee in order to set up an account, and they do that rather than hiding the fee in the administrative costs, as most funds usually do. Okay, well, um, principally, I'm, uh, this money is just sitting around doing nothing right now. Hmm. Um, so... Well, sometimes that's better than losing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's not losing it just from the inflation uh, aspect of things. Right. When you say, say it's sitting around not doing anything, you mean in a savings account? Well, uh, in an uh, E-Trade um, wash, wash account. Yeah, which is like a money market fund account, I suppose. Right. Okay. Well, uh you uh, want to think about either setting up a what I uh, what I would like to see you do is to set up a permanent portfolio of your your own or in the in before you feel capable of doing that maybe uh, just uh, keep the money in the permanent portfolio fund. One thing I should mention is as you gathered from the beginning of the show, uh, the permanent portfolio fund is a sponsor of this show right. and. Secondly, uh, what you may not be aware of is that I have been a consultant to the fund since its inception in 1982. So you have to take that into consideration when you listen to what I say. That's that's true, uh, but it has done really well over the last well over the life of the fund. It's done extremely well, has it not, compared to uh, a lot of the other. Yes. Now there are going to be other funds that have a higher yearly return over a long period, but they get that return with what I keep referring to as the roller coaster ride. You are, have these wide swings where you're up one year by 30%, and then the next year you're down 15%, and so on. Whereas if you look, uh, if you could look at a graph of the permanent portfolio fund or the kind of permanent personal permanent portfolio that I recommend, what you see is just steady growth year after year after year of a more modest amount. In the case of uh, the personal permanent portfolio, that has gained 9% a year over the last 30 years, and the fund return has been similar with no big losing years at any time. So it's much easier to stay with that kind of a program because you don't get into a period like 2000 to 2002 when the stock market is falling and your favorite mutual fund is doing badly and you think, gosh, 
I've got to abandon this and do something else, and you drop out of it right at the bottom as it starts to go back up again. That's kind of what I did with the stock market, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, it's not the least bit unusual, and, that, and that's why stability is just as important as performance because a lack of stability can cause you to be anxious about it all the time and secondly to make poor decisions because the swings in the market uh, affect you and you can only write it down so far so you finally get out of it and you may get out of it halfway down or you may get out of it right at the bottom okay, that's about what I did so. okay well James okay I'll... well Harry thanks very much for your help I uh, wish you the very best, James, so uh, let us know how it turns out. All right, good day. All right. Uh, I have a question from Greg out in cyberspace who sir, says, This week I learned of TLT, which is an iShare ETF or exchange-traded fund. In other words, it's a mutual fund that's not open-ended. It's a closed-end fund that trades on an exchange. And this fund, TLT, is for treasury holds treasuries greater than 20 years in maturity and he says the holdings are comprised of 99 percent treasury notes and bonds managed by barclays global fund advisors and his question of course is do i view tlt as an alternative investment to actual long-term bonds well from what you've said greg it sounds very very good and could be used as the way of investing in bonds in your own permanent portfolio. But I'm going to have to take a look at it. I'll try to do it at the next break, but I may need more time than that. And if so, then I'll look at it during the week and respond next week. But one way or another, I will get back to you about this. Pierre, who's uh, out there in cyberspace somewhere, says, What do you think about real estate? Do you own any investment properties? Well, that's private information. Pierre. If so, what kind and what kind do you recommend? Also, is it a good time for people that have the ability to purchase a first home to do so? Thank you. All right, well, we have two questions here. What do I think about real estate? And the second one, is this a good time for people to purchase their first home? Uh, I believe that real estate is not an investment, like bonds or stocks or uh, gold. With stocks, bonds, or gold, for example, you can look in the Wall Street Journal or the daily uh, local newspaper and see what your investment is worth. You know exactly what the value of your investment is today. You also can call a broker and sell your investment and have the money transferred to your account or transferred to your bank immediately. Uh, neither of those things can you do with real estate. Real estate, you have no idea what the value of your property is. You can only guess based on what other properties have sold in your area. Secondly, if you decide to sell it, you can't call a broker and sell it. You have to call a broker, get it listed, and eventually get it sold. And when you get it sold, which may be a month or six months from now, it, the money then has to go into escrow, and you may not get it for another 30 or 60 days after the sale takes place. Completely different from investments. Also, real estate is not divisible the way stocks, bonds, and gold are. You can't just sell off part of a property. You've got to sell the whole thing or nothing. We'll continue with this brief discussion of real estate when we come back. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. And this is Harry Brown. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and uh, we're talking about real estate uh, because of a question from Pierre, and I said real estate is not an investment like stocks, bonds, or gold, or commodities because you don't know the value of it at any given time. You can't sell it 
immediately when you decide to sell, and you can't get the proceeds from the sale immediately. Plus, you cannot divide up a piece of property and sell off just the back porch of a house, for instance, whereas with stocks, bonds, or gold, you can sell just a portion of uh, what you own at any given time. Uh, if you own a uh, thousand shares of stock in a company, you can sell a hundred of them, or you can add a hundred to them, uh, and so on. So, if real estate is not an investment, then what is it? Well, I think it's one of three things. It's either a consumption item. You buy a home because you'd rather own the home than rent it, just like you buy a car because you'd rather own the car than to lease it or to rent it day to day. And uh, that uh, has a very definite consumption value to you. Uh, you have control of the house. You can make changes. You can remodel it. You can do whatever you want without asking anybody's permission. So there's a very definite consumption value in owning a home as opposed to renting one. The second possible use for real estate is as a business. There are people who spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week buying and selling real estate identifying what they think are good locations, and they're in business. It's a business of real estate, just like furniture dealers buy furniture and sell furniture and make decisions about these things. And furniture dealers, of course, know a great deal more about furniture than you do. They know about the origins of kinds of furniture. They know about the applications, and they know about the market for furniture. They are continually testing the market. Whereas you, all you know is you like that uh, dinette set that your spouse bought a few months ago. In real estate, the same thing. People who are in business of real estate uh, spend all their time figuring out which locations are best, why people like certain things rather than other things, and why some things go up in value much faster than other things go up in value. So real estate might be a business for someone who wants to devote full time to it. And third, real estate can be a speculation. Somebody says, hey, there's this property. They're starting to develop in uh, Paradise Valley or wherever, and I'd like to get in on the ground floor. I'm going to buy this. Or I noticed that this uh, vacant lot was available, and I think they're going to start building around it pretty soon, so somebody's going to want to buy that lot. I think I'll buy it and hold it as a speculation. Uh, so this is something that you might do with money you can afford to lose. So real estate's either consumption value uh, and a business. Pardon me. If real estate's either consumption value, a business, or a speculation, but it's not an investment. And uh, you ask, what I do? I own any investment properties? You mean do I own any speculative properties? And the answer is no. I'm at an age where I'm just not interested in speculating anymore, but there's nothing wrong with it, provided you do it with money you can afford to lose. But the question, is this a good time for people who have the ability to purchase a first home? Um, and I would say, yes, if that's what you want. But look at it as a consumption value. The value of that home may, in fact, go down on the market. There are periods when real estate declines in value. It is not a one-way street, although a lot of people like to make us think that it's a one-way street. But be prepared for that possibility, so just make sure you have enough equity in the house to be able to withstand a decline. But if you want to own your own home, then and you can afford to do it, then do it. All right, uh, returning to our study uh, questions about economics, I said that there are vast differences between economics and the physical sciences, meaning physics and chemistry and so on. And, in fact, there are four basic differences, and we won't have time to deal with them all today, but let's take the first one. The physical sciences deal in things, particles, forces, masses, uh, substances, structures, and these things are uniform and constant. Uniform meaning that every one is like every other one. Every electron is identical to every other electron, and they remain the same today, tomorrow, and forever. So what an electron is today is what it will be tomorrow, and each one is a perfect specimen. But economics deals with people, 
human beings who think and learn and pursue individual goals, in, including goals that they can't even clearly define. Each person is different from everybody else, and each person changes from day to day in one way or another. Now, in the physical sciences, they hold experiments, and they try to isolate each variable so that a scientist can identify and measure the separate influence and effect of each factor. So a scientist knows if you add a little bit of this to the formula, to the mixture, whatever, you will get exactly that as the outcome. Uh, but in economics, those so-called particles are human beings, each of which is different from the other, and the forces are their many changing desires. So you can't say that this particular principle is going to work the same in all cases, or the addition of this particular item is going to produce this result without fail. All right, we have one last segment to uh, cover a little bit more of this. And we'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Don't go away. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Fail Safe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Fail Safe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. Well, thank you so much for listening today, and I hope you'll be back with me next week. Uh, but we're not quite done yet, and I just want to wrap up this whole question of the difference between the physical sciences and economics. I mentioned that with phys the physical sciences, you can make tests in laboratories, introduce diff different elements, and see the results and have a good idea that these results are permanent, that they will always apply. Other people will try to duplicate the experiments to make sure that they are valid and that they really are what they say, and certain things then become established as basic principles of physics or chemistry that are unchanging. But everything in economics deals with the actions and values of individual human beings. And now, we can talk about economic issues that seem to be impersonal, uh, such as the supply of wheat or the level of interest rates. But wheat doesn't plant itself. It doesn't fertilize itself. It doesn't harvest itself. It doesn't offer itself for sale. When we talk about wheat or interest rates, we're really talking about what thinking, purposeful individuals do as producers, consumers, borrowers, lenders, wheat planters, whatever it may be, we're talking about how individual human thoughts and actions affect the price of wheat or the uh, level of interest rates. Economics is dealing with human choices, and those human choices are constantly changing. So there's very little in the methodology of the physical sciences that you can use in economics. You can't herd individual human beings into a laboratory for controlled tests to try to discover their reactions to every imaginable set of circumstances. And even if you could, you could have those same people tomorrow or, or next week and the results would be different because these people are learning all the time, learning the right things or the wrong things, but they're changing their set of knowledge continually. 
Human action is never suspended or brought to a standstill so that we can isolate, uh, inspect, and analyze the elements of human activity the way physical scientists do with electrons and neutrons and other things to arrive at certain things. So the techniques of the physical sciences can't be used to verify an economic principle. What is learned about the physical sciences to enable you to drive a car with confidence, knowing that when you put your foot on the gas, the car will go faster, or when you flick the light switch, the headlights will go on, or when you push a button, the radio comes on. That's all been accomplished by the physical sciences. You can't use that kind of methodology that created that to create principles that you can rely on in investing based on economic action. But we will show you in the next broadcast or so how you can use economics and what its purpose should be. All right, that music means it's time to go. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to come back. Come back, you hear? Thank you.